All right, folks, welcome to this very short uh, jump into five tips on asynchronous discussions. Uh, I'm actually going to add one extra tip that I didn't include, but since I'm here, why not? Uh, so if you are actually presenting on Google Slides and using Chrome, when you come down here with your cursor and click on the three dots, you can come to captions and you can turn on closed captioning. So if you notice now at the bottom, it's doing closed captioning. It's not great closed captioning because there's no punctuation. But if you actually want to, you know, help people hear a little bit more or read a little bit more of what you're saying, uh, this is an option to include. So just wanted to point that out because I think that's something we sometimes miss. Um, and you can also go into uh, the captions options and select kind of where they appear and how big you want them. I'm going to turn those off for now because I'll probably have this closed captioned on its own. Uh, so here we are. All right, five tips. We're going to get through these hopefully pretty quickly. Um, the first is actually a lot of discussions are usually very kind of um, direct and it's usually like I'm going to ask you a question about what you think and then you're going to respond and then two people are going to reply to you. And there's lots of different ways to have very, very rich discussions. Uh, at the end of this, I will have a guide and that will have some of these ideas explained. But the big one I like to use and that I see used really well is role play and role playing. Um, so the way that I think of these is that they're, they're two sides of the, the same coin. Um, a role play is typically when you create a scenario and all the students play the same role. So the example I always go to is in my popular culture course, when we look at horror comics in the 1950s, we have students uh, basically play the role of the comic book, uh, comic book authority editor and they have to judge and evaluate the comics based on the comic code authority of the that, that came up in the 1950s. So each one of them goes in there and uses that as their role to kind of explore and talk about comics and what they saw and you know how that fits with with their understanding of what censorship is and the like. So that's kind of what I mean by role play. And then there's role playing where students take on within a given discussion, lots of different roles. I always go back to my favorite example of a, a faculty member who was teaching horticulture and ha she had each of the students take on a different role within the soil. So, you know, one was like some kind of fungus, another was some kind of like protein and what they did was over the course of the spring semester, each one of them was engaging in the discussion as, through the lens of that particular thing. And so they would be talking about what's going on, how they're interacting with the other characters, what they're expecting with the weather forecast that's coming up and how that's going to affect them. So this could be adapted really easily into different processes, different work environments, coming up with these different roles that students have to work their way through and engage with one another. Um, as I said, there's a bunch of others here that are listed and in the handout, you can kind of go into those um, much more deeply. But the idea is, you know, at its basic, really th rethinking the, the discussion to be a little more lively or have a little more stake in it than what have been traditional discussions. Uh, the next one that I always uh, is one of my favorites is really kind of getting students to create the questions. So the discussion is more focused about what are the kinds of questions they can start to ask. Um, I build on this from the uh, Warren Berger. He's written two really great books. One is the beautiful book of questions. The other is a more beautiful question. Uh, and ultimately he created the Right Question Institute. And a lot of this is really thinking about, you know, when we're asking students questions, we're really just trying to like mine their knowledge. And that's a very like um, banking model of, of education, like how much do you know versus having them ask questions and start to learn how to ask deep questions. And when we think about the kind of places they are going into and, and what we really think about in terms of um, analyzing, it starts with questions. And so there's, there's the Right Question Institute has several different ways you can work through this. One is you have students, they start to develop uh, questions that engage the ideas, concepts, and learning from a given week. And that can, you can either have them try to create like a singular, really, you know, uh, complex question, or you can ha have them create kind of as many questions as you can. And in the response period, you can have students then go in with one another 
add and edit or flip questions. Flip question, flipping a question is kind of changing the dynamics. So if it was an open question, you turn it to a closed question. If it was a closed question, you turn it to an open um, or rearranging cause and effect, um, really kind of playing around with the structures. And then you can have a third round where students actually try to answer the questions. Um, you can play with these three, you know, these three in and of themselves throughout one discussion over the course of a few weeks. But it is a way of, of kind of pushing a little bit more, thinking a little bit differently about what we use discussions for rather than us asking them the questions, getting them to come up with some really good questions. Uh, another is what I call the never ending conversation. So typically in many classes, you create a discussion and it is there for one week and then it ends and is the most artificial thing ever because discussions do not start and end in this like, okay, in seven days, we're doing one post and two replies or whatever the you know, generic way of doing it is. In this one, you start at the very beginning of the semester and you maybe start a few discussions or a few, you know, a few particular uh, starters, which might be topics or themes. And the idea is that each week they come back into those themes and further engage, adding or engaging further with what has already been said with what are the new ideas that you're encountering. So, you know, in a, in a history course, if you were covering particular themes of history, you might come back to like, okay, you know, we're coming back to this, this particular concept of human rights in history, and how has this changed, or how do we understand this differently now that we've, you know, explored the, the 1800s or the 1900s. Um, so really, rather than keeping it singular in focus, understanding that it's a longer discussion to which they can continue to call back because it's still in the same discussion. Typically what happens in discussions is like week one's discussion is with the week one's material and week two is with the weeks two. But in here, you have that same conversation that they keep going back to, keep going back to. So this week, I may reply to student one, and, and student one might reply to student two. But the following week, we might change up. But we still have that history of what has been said before to build on. Another is embedding the conversation in a text uh, or, or embedding the discussion uh, within a text. And I use this a lot, um, particularly when I, when I think it's valuable for us to really dig into something that we've read um, or some kind of visual. And typically for me, I will usually throw it into Google Docs because I find Google Docs um, easier or a lower threshold. There's not other accounts, but there's other tools that do this, Perusal and Hypothesis or others. But here becomes this opportunity to for students to highlight and you know make comments and for people to respond. I also like this within Google Docs because if we're a Gmail school, uh, I get the replies right in my inbox. And if I tag other students, they get the replies right in their inbox and they can reply within their inbox. They don't necessarily have to go back into the material. Um, so I think Google does this really well because it gives the context of like, this is the section that was highlighted. This is what you know the previous person said. And right in that email, you can reply to, to it further. Um, but I really like this because it can really help students see, you know, we have a lot of thoughts around a particular text versus when you're in the classroom and you say, what do you remember from what we read last night? And this has them, you know, I think this is the closest way we have to going to the videotape um, as, as we might have uh, with, with text out there. And then the other big thing I'm actually a fan of is just dis ditching the discussion board um, and really rethinking what we do in terms of how we do discussions or, or engagement or student to student interactions. So I've, you know, I'm a big fan of encouraging peer to peer interactions. So in a given week, you know, students get assigned to two different peers that they have to have a 20 minute, half hour conversation with, and that could be via phone, via via phone or video calls. And usually, I will usually encourage giving them like a protocol or some kind of container to focus their discussion because they can, it's great that they're having a discussion but trying to ground it within what's going on in the course. You hope they'll go beyond that. Um, and then having them report back about what they learned from the other person. Uh, there's other tools out there like Slack, Gchat, G -chat, texting, other tools that you might try to think about conversations and, and interactions a little bit differently. And then there's other collaborative tools. There's wikis, there's blogging, there's Twitter chats, um, and even using something like Jamboards where students are able to kind of create a visual explanation and then be able to comment on one another's Jamboards, either within the same Jamboard or across several different ones. So 
those are my, my five tips uh, with that, that bonus one. And then here are a couple of the resources that helped create this. So there's a handout that has additional tips and information expanding upon some of the stuff that we covered here, uh, the slides if you want access to them, and then image resources came from Creative Commons. And uh, for some of the editing, I used image background remover. So that's all. Thank you all very much. And I hope this is useful. And if so, please let me know. Or if you're looking for other tips, uh, please reach out.